Let's get starting again. Welcome everybody. Um, today we are here, I'm myself, John Leslie, and we're also here with Patrick Palm. I'm in Maine, Portland, Maine. Patrick Palm is joining us from Sweden, yeah, Uppsala. And uh, Ali Otterson is our special guest today, joining us from Iceland. So, Regular Iceland. Yes, all the, all the cold places, just not right now. <laughs> um, so I am going to uh, share my screen and we'll get rolling with the actual webinar. Okay, so we are, as we did in last week's webinar, we're running the entire webinar out of Favro. So here's Favro uh, showing the versatility of the tool. Um, you can even present out of it. So let's get started with the agenda. Uh, this first, we're going to do a little bit of a more of an introduction, um, some background on on Patrick, uh, myself, and also Ali. And Patrick is going to tell us about the vision behind Favro and what was the origin story essentially of Favro. And then we'll have a little chat. Patrick will have a chat with Ali talking about his experience. Um, in the industry over the past 20 years at Riot Games, at CCP prior to that, and now as a game, uh, game industry investor. Then we'll dive into more of the, the meat of the presentation, talking about the remote game studio. What are the benefits? What are the challenges? Um, some solutions to those challenges. Uh, we'll also be talking uh, quickly about the Favreau Quick Start package that uh, Broadcove Insights, my company, has put together in partnership with Favro to help um, game studios make the transition to remote as quickly and, and effortly as possible. And then we'll open it up to QA. So speaking of Q Q and A, um, feel free. There should be a little button down there at the bottom of your interface to be entering in questions as we're going through this talk. So feel free to enter in questions at any time. We'll get to as many as we possibly can. All right, um, so Patrick, please take it away. Thanks, John. Um, so um, we have been doing a, a, a few of these uh, webinars now this, uh, this summer and uh, you know, this, uh, this, this, uh, this turned out really great. Um, uh, the, um, the short origin story to, uh, to Favro for the ones of you that, that don't know it um, is that my two fellow co-founders, uh, Eric and, and Hans, and I, you know, we were, we were um, starting and, and building another company before called Handsoft. Um, that was a platform for working in, in an agile way uh, in, uh, you know, large um, software companies uh, and among those many game studios. And we sold that company in 2017 to, to an American company. And, you know, over all these years, um, we, you know, we learned many things. And, when we, you know, we sold, we sold Handsoft to, to be able to focus uh, entirely on, on, on Favro and, 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 and the ideas and the vision uh, with, with Favro. And they're basically, you know, three. So uh, the first one is that we saw that Agile was really crossing over to, to any kind of team. Uh, you know, marketing teams, uh, operations, you know, sales, you know, management, you know, basically everyone. So we thought if we can design a tool from, from scratch um, with the whole organization in mind, uh, every team, uh, what would that look like? And, and that was basically the first idea. And the second idea was um, we, um, we saw that organizations are quite organic by nature. Um, you might have an ID or a, or a framework around how you want to run things, but things change all the time because people change. You know, you have new people joining, you know, some leaving, people change position, some things work, some don't. So, so you know, just in nature, uh, organizations are organic. So we thought if we're going to design a tool for, for this kind of organization that allows teams to be highly autonomous, but at the same time aligned, uh, towards you know the the goals of of the company, um, you know what would that look like? 
And and the third um, idea behind Favro is, is quite simple. It's, it's, it's going cloud, but going cloud um, with an enterprise grade solution that lives up to the security demands and the data locality demands of, of enterprises today. And some of the clients we, we have are also some of the most uh, demanding companies in the world, you know, when it comes to, to, to these kind of things. So that, that's, the, that's the three ideas, you know, behind why, why we got into this business. And um, you know, one of the things which is, which is really cool about being in this industry is that you meet some truly innovative companies and you meet some very brilliant people. Um, and on the journey uh, with, with, uh, with Favreau, uh, we for sure um, uh, had uh, some, some dealings with Ali, you know, who's, who's here today uh, from, from Riot Games. But I did actually meet him before though. I mean, our, our history goes way back um, because at Handsoft, that was the first time I, I, I met Ali in, in, in Iceland um, when he was at, at CCP. So, um, uh, so, so we kind of go far back and, and now, um, when Ali is an um, independent uh, investor, um, we've had a, the opportunity to, to, to discuss and do also some investment deals together um, uh, with Ali's investment business and, and with my kind of side business as, as an angel investor in, in, in games and game tech and, and AI and, and deep tech and, and uh, you know, similar things. So our paths have crossed, you know, many times. Um, so I'm super happy that you could join us today uh, in the middle of um, the, 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 the summer here. And uh, summer in, in, in Sweden is, is quite nice because it's, it's, it's summer, but it's not too hot. And in, I would probably argue that in many ways it's even better in Iceland because, you know, my perspective is that summer in Sweden is the best in the very north part of Sweden where you get, you know, kind of polar circle and then you get these very long nights and it's, it's beautiful. And and that's basically your whole country. So so you know the, what we what I think is the best part of Sweden during summer. That that's basically that's your standard. So um, you're probably having a, a great time right now. So thanks for for joining from from the uh, the summer situation. Yeah. Um, but maybe we can start by you know your origin story. I mean you you've done an amazing journey in in in, in this industry, and 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 I think we all would love to just hear. Uh, you know your journey that, that brought you to this point of of, of investing in, in cool uh, game companies yeah so um thank you guys first for for having me and uh, uh it's a pleasure to be here uh you've been talking about ideas a lot so I, I brought two ids so this is my passport and here is my driver's license so uh i have i have two ids for you too um but uh yeah so my my origin uh, story, I guess, starts uh, when I joined CCP uh, into the game industry. I was working for a video game, sorry, for a, 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 a startup in Iceland that was like an internet startup. It was a kind of like a Sputnik company that attracted a lot of talent in Iceland. And uh, all of the original uh, uh, staff, or most of the original staff at CCP met at this company, it's called OS. And I was pretty young in my career, and and I thought I was very lucky to have the opportunity to work work there. Um, and uh, video games were were simply not created in Iceland, and the video game industry was very very far away. And I think it was uh, it was uh, it was a little bit uh, weird uh, in a sense to be tackling a a large complex. Uh, MMO project which CCP set out to do uh, without having any experience in the field and nobody to talk to. Yeah, there was one guy we knew from OS who had made it to the West Coast in America who was working in games and we, we would sometimes call him late at night, but that was it. And, uh, uh, but Eve came out in 2003 and, uh, and I think because of this, a unique perspective of, of not having done this before, it became this unique product and uh, it's still around today, 17 years later. I was lucky enough to you know, grow uh, with the company. I started out as an engineer. I wasn't a very good engineer. And so uh, as, as the company grew, I scaled out of that and turned to management project and program management first uh, and then let uh, CCP's transition to cross-functional teams and, and more agile as, as that was becoming a thing in the game industry. 
Uh, and then the company grew even further internationally. We had offices uh, in uh, the UK, in China, and in the US. And, uh, and I took kind of like a broad perspective around our production practices uh, across, found myself traveling a bit between those offices. And, uh, and CCP, like, it grew uh, not only in offices, but also just in statue and, and uh, uh, and the game uh, at that point uh, had earned many accolades. And, uh, and we started to talk a bit about how we were doing uh, things at CCP. And, uh, and I did a handful of, of presentations uh, on that uh, at numerous GDCs and others. And that's how I initially met people from Riot Games. So in 2009, League of Legends came out. And, uh, and I think just initially thereafter, uh, I met folks from from Riot at conferences, and and we started to talk about production practices and uh, and share knowledge. And I I, I did a uh, a visit to their to their offices pretty early on, um, and that was in their old old offices, which are not nearly as fancy as their their new new offices. Uh, and uh, and we and we had kind of like a back and forth dialogue. Uh, at the time, there weren't many companies that were geared up to be be delivering online uh, gaming experiences directly to their to their customers and riot was hyper focused around its players and so we were able to share a lot of insights in that, in that sense and then in 2012 uh, i i ended up joining uh, riot games um, and uh, started working on league of legends as the development director uh, and um, and uh, and leak of course continued to to grow um, and grow quite a bit so that team uh, when i interviewed the company was 400 or 200 people and when i joined like a few months later it was 400 people and uh, and i think within the first two two years it had you know uh, doubled again and so uh, and uh, so that was uh, that's, it was an exciting time, but also obviously a lot of uh, challenges, and uh, especially on the production side, as as the as um, as the game was was growing, and and uh, we had some kind of like early stability issues and and, and growing pains overall. Uh, and then I I I helped with the um, uh, organizational scaling at, at Riot uh, and uh, ultimately ended up managing development managers and development directors across uh, all of the game uh, properties. Uh, many of them have seen the light of day by now and, uh, and if you haven't checked them out, you should check them out. They're all very, very fun to play. And, uh, and then last year, I, uh, I, I left Riot to pursue a passion of mine, which is startups and investing so alongside my riot journey i had started to do uh, a few angel investments and that grew um, uh, also over time and uh, i had become a a a i wouldn't say significant but somewhat uh, established portfolio and i just wanted to do more of that and uh, and that's what i've been doing for the last year i i know you have some favorites um among those games that's been coming out that you, you know, are, you can announce, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, so my, the, I, I, I've been playing a lot of Valorant personally recently, and so I think that's a fantastic game. Yeah. Did, did it, um, I mean, maybe this is a sensitive question, but did it, did it uh, come out the way that you thought it would come out? Or did, did, was it, you know, your, your, what you saw when you were on that project, was it, something kind of different from what came out uh for that specifically uh not really i think uh they uh, there is a i mean yes of course it's not exactly the same but the, the base thesis uh stood quite a bit there and uh and uh yeah and so uh cool yeah. uh, so um you know going a little bit deeper into your investment um what is it that you're looking for uh, for you know anyone who who contacts you um, and and looks for your money? Right. You know, what 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 is it that 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 you will be looking into then? Or alternatively, if you are proactively looking for uh, for companies, what is it that you're looking for? Yeah, 
So, uh, so investment for me is, is both uh, um, uh, angel investing and strategic advising at a, at a personal level, but I also work with uh, a VC fund that, um, uh, that focuses on the video game industry as well. And so uh, for me personally, uh, I like to uh, invest in companies where I can add a lot of value because like I said, I, I got really got hooked on the investing advising combo uh, in this. And so uh, that looks like uh, like multiplayer online uh, experience uh, experiences mostly you'll see in the things that, that I get involved with. But that's not like singular in that, in that sense. Um, I've also done a, a fair amount in mobile and, and mobile platforms. And then on the fun side, we really look at the industry in three buckets, uh, which is game or con content games, and um, and then platforms, middleware, or things that cross across cut across uh, the spectrum. And then thirdly, uh, ecosystem like esports or influencer uh, type companies. And um, you know, more from a um, kind of you know team point of view. Um, when you evaluate the, you know, the group which is approaching you, um, what is it that you're looking for for there? Yeah, I think you know I look for uh, for experience and domain, both knowledge and passion. So uh, I think it's okay that uh, founders haven't done the exact game before, as long as they have a deep understanding for that genre. Uh, and a deep passion uh, for that. Um, but in some cases, uh, I come across uh, you know, people who've been making mobile games for the last decade, and then they, wa they wanna go do a, a hardcore PC survival MMO or something like that. Um, sometimes that, that looks plausible, sometimes not. Uh, I think I also look at team comp quite a bit in terms of uh, if you have two or three founders, how are they complementing each other? Um, if it's uh, two crazy, uh, bright creatives, um, but with no engineering or, or production business uh, attributes, um, that would be less likely than a well-rounded combination of, 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 of three founders that really complement each other. So you know, you mentioned that you're also doing work with um with a with a venture fund, um, and I know that fund is on your your LinkedIn. So I guess it's not a secret, right? Uh, can you tell more about that? Yeah. So uh, the uh, the fund is called Makers Fund, and it is a a fund that was established in 2017 by two partners that really wanted to um, help out in the gaming industry with a specific gap that they saw when it comes to funding, in particular at later stages. And so, uh, you know, since then the landscape has evolved quite a bit um, and there are now more funds than ever that are focusing on games and more non-gaming funds also that are focusing on, on, on games. But that uh, still holds is that there's a lot of early stage or seed invested, invested focus funds um, um, I know that you're involved with uh, with one uh, uh, that is of that that nature as well, and so uh, so they the, the focus is to, is to really be at that kind of like series A stage uh, mostly. Of course, we do some seed. Um, we we also do some later stage uh, if it's appropriate. Yeah, so you know you're right. I, I I'm I'm a limited partner in um, in Play Ventures. So I'm obviously very enthusiastic about what we do and and there's been an amazing array of of investments you know happening there the the, the team at the fund are doing a fantastic job um, but what i also noticed because you you, you kind of get a nice overview perspective of what's going on in the industry is that you know makers fund have got a, like a fantastic reputation in in short time uh, it was it was i i knew it already earlier but i definitely uh, heard that you know when i was at slush last year um uh, this is obviously before Corona, so everyone can hang out, you know, we can drink beer, you know, you ask people, so what do you think about these guys? And everyone's like raving about them. So what do you think that they got right? Because 
you know, we, we're all three of us has been in the in the industry for a very long time, and I think it's safe to say that there's been a pretty uh, it's been, been quite common to have a skepticism around venture capital companies uh, in in the in the game industry, and I think that has changed. I think it's more uh, positive now, and and uh, hearing people you know raving about a fund like you know Makers Fund is definitely, if not a new phenomenon, it hasn't always been like that. So so what do you, what do you think that they got so right in in, a, in such a short time? Yeah, I think. The I think generally the funding landscape in the the like two years ago or three years ago uh, when it comes to video games there there was maybe one or two uh, funds that really understood game and game making and so um, and and a lot of um, yeah and so I think when they when they came on so there were two partners and a team and now in their second fund there are three partners and they are. They are very in tune with the with the video game industry. Very well plugged plugged in. Uh, have a deep understanding on not how game development works, but also uh, on the business side, on the platforms with um, uh, with the markets uh, across the world. I think Game uh, Makers' unique point also is that they are a truly global fund, and so many uh, of the uh, gaming focused funds are are more regional um, and. Um, and so they 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 truly have a a global presence and, and and a global perspective. And I think for founders, they've proven that they really engage with with founders. They really go deep with them. They go and roll up their sleeves and and help them uh, not only through their their networks, uh, which are which are quite quite vast, but uh, but also just on a on a on a on a personal level. So um, a pretty common, you know, saying, you know, from investors, but also from from many entrepreneurs, is that, you know, you know, building a successful company is, you know, you know, five percent uh, inspiration, ninety five percent transpiration, or you know, five percent ID and ninety five percent execution. Yeah. There's there's many variants of this, um, and and obviously, you know. Uh, you know, startups tend to not be the most heavy on on processes and tools, um, but but there's 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 definitely that you know you know you also need to to execute. Um, I'm I'm I, I'm obviously very interested here in the perspective of you know how how can how can favor help uh, you know for for these startups. I mean, I noticed that even though you know many of the favor you know clients in the game industry are. are Relatively large studios, in you know, with hundreds of users or even thousands of users, uh, but but there's also a lot of startups, um, you know, entirely new, you know new companies and you know many that I you know might not have heard about before and and you know I I kind of research them and I'm very eager to find out you know what kind of cool stuff they're working on, so so I I, I just see from the data that obviously um, small companies that are are startups care. Right. Um, but but more from your point of view, since you're also strategic advisor, um, what, what's your what's your angle on how how Favre can possibly help um, uh, startups in the game industry? Yeah, so I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, early on, it's it's certainly not about the the tooling and more about just understanding uh, what your core audience is and how you can cater to that and finding the fun engagement in in whatever. Uh, Core game or core loop you are you're 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 trying to get at, um, but video game companies they move fast and so it's like and especially on the on the mobile space and especially now when we have um, all of you know the engines at their kind of elevated state now and and libraries and content available and so you you know it's it's it it can be really fast and so before you know it you've grown your two person team to a ten person team or or fifteen twenty. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, and, and, and startups uh, very quickly on need to start to get organized. And 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 one one thing that I've I've noticed um, in kind of like the last year is uh, there's a kind of like a uh, there's a one particular deck uh, uh, that I've been sending out to you know a lot of startup funders, which is. Uh, which is a, a kind of like it was presented a year ago at a startup conference. It's around uh, switching to outcome 
uh, driven roadmaps or focusing on on outcomes over over outputs, and uh, uh, which is certainly something that uh, that we spent a few years at Riot like hammering into not only like the culture but also the way that we work. Um, but um, uh, but this was very well captured in this in the stack, and I, I sent this out a lot, and so. Uh, and I think when you then try to apply uh, that to the way that you you work, not only from a mindset perspective, but from a from a execution perspective, you can often get you know clanged up against your your tools. And so I think Favaro does a really good job of um, of having kind of like the flexibility to um, to to structure your your work and your organization um, in a in a way that that lends it well to be able to match like nonlinear complex backlogs potentially against like also nonlinear but cascading outcomes. Um, yeah, and so uh, and I yeah and I, I, that's that's definitely a, a startup trend that I that I see often. Not everybody tries to solve it with with Favaro, but I've certainly seen it seen it solved elegantly with Favaro. Well, that's great to hear. And and for for people that are, are not entirely familiar with you know what does kind of an outcome driven approach you know mean in in right. comparison to something else do you have do you have some good uh, examples from the game industry yeah i, I think uh, i think you see that a lot uh, i mean you can take any anything that you do uh, in terms of delivering a game or feature or a piece of content and just translate it from like the thing that you're doing to that the thing that it, it produces. And the way that we like to talk about it is like, what is the behavioral change that happens in the world? Like what do players do differently? And then uh, the trick is to be able to capture and assert that somehow uh, through some sort of, uh, of metric. Um, uh, and I think, I mean, you guys are, are a startup and I'm sure you guys also uh, try to take uh, an outcome uh, centric approach to to what you guys are doing. Do you have an example from from Favreau that that yeah, you know the no, audience I, maybe has from the with? I I, th I think you know outcome driven uh, development or really outcome driven goals um, is is very applicable for you know any kind of team. Um, to have some concrete examples, I think you know for for example in our case um, we see that. Uh, teams that are using Favro, uh, they are they are qu have a quite high engagement level. So right. you have you know managers that you know they you know they, they plan thing, you know they set up collections to give an overview. Uh, you know teams can look at that, but then if you look at the individuals, uh, often they have a relatively large amount of autonomy for you know you know creating new you know kind of goals, objectives, tasks, and you know moving them along. Uh, but they also do a lot of the writing, and you know, writing that they might have been doing in, you know, Google Doc or in some kind of content management tool before. You know, they they now do in in favor. So it means that you know their their engagement is quite high. Right. So, so engagement is key for us. So we try to set engagement goals for every feature that we develop, and then we measure. So we developed this feature, you know, we launched it. Uh, what does the data say in terms of engagement? What does the what was the feedback from the community? Um, and what does kind of more, let's say, deep interviews with with, with power users, uh, you know, right. say? So we, we try to, you know, use that kind of like triangle to evaluate, you know, did we do a good job or not? Should we double down on this, or was this a mistake? Yeah. Um, but I also this, think, uh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say there's uh, there's one uh, company that I I'm involved with here in Iceland. Uh, they recently released a a video game. It came out uh, and uh, was the number one game in all of the app store a few weeks ago. Very impressed with that team. And one of the things that, that they do is that they feel really liberated by this, uh, uh, by being able just to lead teams to a specific point, like metric, like this is your metric and you are a seven person team. And that's, 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 you know, those are your marching orders. And yeah. it gives the, the leaders, uh, this is like a 25 person studio. And it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's led by by three founders, and it gives them a lot of uh, yeah, you know, gives the team agency, but also gives them a lot of lot of freedom. I think you're touching upon something very important because uh, you know we're all about uh, team autonomy and company alignment, mm -hmm. and one of the things that people often forget is that a high level of of 
uh, alignment enables autonomy. Yeah. You know, if, 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 if you have the trust, so if you as senior leadership uh, have a trust in kind of your, your processes, and your tools, your culture, that alignment is good, uh, you can give a lot of autonomy to the teams. So, so uh, alignment enables trust. And one of the best ways, well, the easiest ways uh, to do that is by having very clear kind of metrics. And, and this ties into, I mean, there's a lot of talk, if we take this a little bit more general around OKRs, you know, you know objective, you know, key right. results, you know, and, and but, but that kind of thinking is basically the same as we're talking about here. You know, it's, it's, it's not, it, you know, it's, it's a very, it's like different ways of talking about it, but it's, it's right. in many ways the same way, same thing, you know. Yeah, but yeah, uh, I mean, just just this morning, I was talking to another startup uh, in Europe, and they are they're struggling a little bit with this like mindset shift because they're a little bit ingrained in their 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 tooling, like because there's there there isn't like a, a, an option for 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 it, and like and uh, and you kind of like you get bogged down or shoehorned into well, we'll just make the epic the outcome and then all of the user stories are the things and and or, or and then you get very kind of like bogged down in just like one level of thing or two levels of things and uh and and and, and not a really good way to tie things together mm -hmm. yeah we i think we can talk about this specific topic yeah, for a very long yeah, time I, I was just about to to continue the conversation but we have we have to you know keep keep yeah. a little bit track of time so so we don't you know we, we don't want to miss out on john's part as well uh, right. I, I i want to go back to um kind of a little bit your experience with with very big studios again yeah um because if you uh, you know if we look at the the market data today you know we see that you know today um uh you know, the, the game industry is bigger than, than uh, the movie and the music industries combined. So, yeah. so, you know, we're the new kind of big guys, uh, which, is, which is cool because it hasn't always been like that. Um, but it's been like that for a while now, so yeah. Well, maybe you might have the confidence for that, but you know, trust right. me. You know, when I speak to my friends in the film industry, they don't agree. Okay. I, 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 I like have to show them the numbers. Like, come on, you know, it's like right. data, data wins. Um, but but um, but it, but it's not equally divide, um, distributed because if we look now, what happened here with Corona, um, what we have seen very clearly, you know, is, is it there's, there's big differences. You know, you have you know some companies. Um, that were well prepared for Corona, uh, they they could very quickly switch to to you know work from home, um, and um, um, they are you know continue to release um, even entirely new uh, products, and they make a ton of money, and they're doing really well. And then we have some students that are really struggling, and and some very openly admitting to to that you know they're they're, they're having a tough time you know to 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 do this, and and if we're going very kind of you know last you know, weeks or even days, you know, we're seeing now that there's a lot of, you know, uh, increase of lockdowns in, in, in the US again. Um, uh, yeah. So, and it's probably gonna happen, we're probably gonna have a couple of these before this is over, you know, it's not gonna really be over until we have a vaccine and, and everyone's been vaccinated. So, I mean, we, we're gonna have to live with this for quite a while. And I don't think any, any company is really gonna go back to the old normal anyways. So, so basically uh, the winners, in this, in this, I mean, so, so the game industry is is a winner because people are at home, they play more games, so so you have the opportunity for great business success. Uh, but to capture that opportunity, you know, you need you need to have the way of working that 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 functions in this climate, and 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 you're going to need to have that for a while before you can go back to like normal office work if that's what you want to do. And and I, and you know, I know that for example, you know, Riot has been doing uh, pretty pretty well here. Um, so, so my question to you is really, um, what, and I'm not really only talking about you know tools here. I'm I'm really thinking a bit more wide. Um, you know, what 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 in your opinion really makes that difference? You know, the the, the studio which is very well um, prepared and and set up, you know, for for succeeding in this kind of climate in in in, in being a distributed uh, studio uh, versus the one who you know who's not. Yeah. So I, 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 yeah, I think I think Riot has been able to adapt quickly because they're able to adapt quickly. I don't think, uh, but I, of course, I can't really speak uh, to these events because I wasn't wasn't there directly. Um, 
but I would imagine that uh, that uh, uh, Riot actually is is um, all of the, the game teams that are very co-located in 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 California uh, for the most part, and so so I, I don't I wouldn't say that it hasn't been, or I would imagine that it hasn't been without ease to to move to um, to remote and and work from home, and. Uh, uh, but it's you know and it's phenomenal phenomenal to see the things that they've been able to output. I mean, we were talking about Valorant earlier. Uh, that that did not miss miss a beat and uh, like you know came out I think uh, uh, right around when when everybody expected it to come out and and I think before even the players expected it to come out and and to see that in the middle of of Corona and everybody working for for home from for the last like weeks and months of that was was I was super impressed. Um, so uh, so I do think that uh, that Riot uh, has a culture of of just like you know of of being adaptive and being able to 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 do things like that. Even though it's not, uh, yeah, there are some things that have been have been set up in 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 recent years, like moving more things to the cloud, having more SSO and 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 things like that that makes that easier now than it would have been two years before or three years before. Um, but I also think it's a lot about the, the people there and, and kind of like the, the aptitude that Riot has hired for for a decade where you get uh, individuals that are entrepreneurial and, and, and able to, to you know, adapt well to, to rapidly changing uh, circumstances. Yeah, uh, cool. You know, finally, I, I of course have to ask a more kind of direct, you know, you know, Favreau question. Um, I mean, one of the things that we we see uh, with, with our clients is, is is that they they don't they don't come from 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 nothing. You know, they always have right. other tools before. You know, and and then they migrate to Favreau, and so they typically replace you know many tools. You know, with <laughs> with, with, with Favreau. Yes. Um, and and, and I, I remember, you know, we, 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 we spoke about that at, at some point, you know, when you were at Riot and, and I, I I remember it was you know seemed like a pretty amazing an, a amount of of tools that you, you had replaced. But but you know, you 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 have um, you have the right story. Um, I mean how um what was your perspective on you know Favreau replacing you know other tools? Yeah, I mean, Farrell certainly did replace uh, many tools. I think just to kind of be, to give the audience a bit of the, the story there was that um, uh, Riot uh, had grown very fast and it's a collection of, of, of multiple departments and business units, both centrally in Los Angeles, but also across the world. So we had had teams that had adopted probably every single project management tool that you can think of. And also some that you can't think of, um, and uh, and there was actually a, a just like a dire need from our central IT organization and compliance and legal to to make sure that we like you know that we had tools that were secure, compliant, that we were paying for them, or that if we weren't paying for them, that the, whatever content we put in there was like. Uh, encrypted or secured and, and whatnot, and so that was a that was a big kind of like um, lead up into the the decision to go and consolidate a lot of uh, a lot of this uh, tool tool um, fragmentation that we had at the time, and so uh, yeah, I I think uh, you know yeah, so it's it 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 replaced not only project management tools, tracking tools collaboration tools, uh, like whiteboard collaboration tools and, and, and stuff like that that were being being used for for, for things like this. Many uh, of them uh, uh, were removed um, uh, quite easily. Like, you know, it's very easy to just say, like, you know, please migrate uh, over in, in X many months and we will discontinue the use of XYZ product. And in some cases, it was more of a, of like, you know, I'm very ingrained in my process in this like, you know, uh, arcane tool that me and my team only use. And, and that was a bit, of, bit, bit more of a battle. And so, yeah, but I, I, it was a large, large number, but it didn't replace everything. And, uh, and a lot of the kind of like core um, 
development had been done on Jira and for, for many teams, they still use Jira. Uh, a lot of the newer teams um, or R&D teams uh, skipped that completely and started working directly in, in Favro. That is the case today. And then Favro was used um, across uh, departments. It was used for the kind of like larger portfolio management on on all of our biggest properties, including League of Legends and our core platform and, and, and things like that. So, uh, so yeah, uh, it was uh, it was a lot of tools. <laughs> I can imagine, and, and you know, the, the thing you mentioned about Jira is not an, entirely uncommon. We we had yeah. to put some extra effort into making sure that our Jira integration, you know, both with Jira Server and with Jira Cloud, uh, uh, you know, is, is, is pretty good because. You know, many students been around for a while. You know, they still have that legacy, and you know, they have. You know, they're not going to migrate overnight, and they have to handle that. Um, awesome. Um, you know, please stick around for for the rest of the webinar for um, uh, you know questions that that comes up. Um, but I do want to make sure that we we hand over now to to John to to see a little bit of uh, the remote game studio uh, in 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 practice using using Favro. Thanks, thanks, Ali. That was excellent. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, so before, it, I don't know if you can stay till the end, Ali, but um, I, I do have a question here from Nico Latour. Yeah. Uh, and I want to make sure we get it answered in case you do have to jump off. Um, she asks, how did you convince Riot to adopt Fabro? What would you recommend to get a mid to large size company to consider trying it out? Uh, yeah, so like I said, the backstory there is always uh, uh, was that there was a there was a need to find something that was uh, that would be applicable to to almost all use uh, use cases because we were um, we were taking away tools from people that were working in esports, in legal, in finance, in game development, in publishing, in comic, book, film. TV development, you know, the whole shebang. And, and, um, and I think Favreau's particular selling point on that was that it was super intuitive and easy to get stood up and started running a project. So you, nobody needed to teach anybody anything, well, almost uh, anything. Whereas, um, uh, yeah, more complex choice, tool choices are obviously available that require, you know, teaching and, and onboarding. I think that was a big, big selling point. And the other one was 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 actually just the the, the the track record of the of the founders, and and the fact that uh, they uh, came from the video game industry. When we were looking at at other um, uh, offerings, there were there were nuances that were that weren't quite like we wanted them to be used, and so but they were more aligned to how you would think about doing a process or approach work in the context of, a, of, a, of game development. And I think that just comes from the experience that, that the team has had working with, with game studios over a decade before that. And then third was that um, I personally had had the experience of being an early customer of Handsoft. And so I knew that we would be able to influence the roadmap quite a bit for a very limited period of time because that was my experience from GCP. It was fantastic to be one of the first customers of Handsoft because we were able to kind of like influence uh, and how the product evolved. Uh, but then very soon after like, you know, behemoth customers like, you know, EA and, and others obviously became even louder voices. And so, um, so but I, I, I had that experience. So I was, I was very convinced that like, you know, that we had a window to be able to, you know, give our opinions into what Favre would become. And that, Turned out to be absolutely true, and uh, and so and, and through engaging with with Patrick and Hans uh, early on, and and yourself, John, from your visits, uh, we've seen a lot of things that have come up in our dialogues. You know, be presented in the product, and I think that's very like uh, unique for like if you are a mid uh, or large tier video game company. Uh, you, I think, to answer the question, like you know, you, that is a thing that I think you can do with Favro, but would not be able to do with insert modern um, project management tool X Y Z, right? And so, yeah. yeah. I, I thank you. Yeah, yeah but, and I think a big part of that <laughs> was uh, when you had me on site way back in twenty, towards the end of twenty sixteen, for that full day to 
kind of walk through Fabro with large groups and answer lots of questions. Um, there were a lot of hard questions, and one of those was the security vetting. Mm -hmm. And I know that that was one of your concerns that there were so many tools being used that weren't security vetted properly at the time, and you wanted to formalize on one kind of lightweight tool, project management yeah. planning collaboration tool, and Fabro passed all of that. I just have to jump in and you know comment on your you know your 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 third thing there, Ali. I mean, the reason you could influence is because you had really good ideas. Yeah, uh, yeah. But it's it felt like my <laughs> my really good ideas didn't have as loud of a voice. Like you know, uh, uh, when you guys got more busy and had large customers <laughs> to attend to, not because well, you know it, it, it's a, it's a natural cycle of a, of a software company that you know when you get more more mature. But but I mean, yeah. to, also to my defense, there I have to say, it, it's pretty cool, you know, with 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 uh, the, the journey with with Favre compared to Hanson because our own iteration cycles are ridiculously faster because of technology choices and and just how the world has become you know better. Uh, so what, what we are doing now is that we uh, uh, we, we have something uh, we, we use something called Canny. So in in our forum, uh, when you interact with us with our customer success, you can suggest uh, features and you can you can vote on them, and and there's typically getting a you know, bit of conversation there, and 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 uh, and that has an influence. You know we. I can be very transparent. I mean, when we look at our own release planning, you know, we have kind of, you know, bigger things that we do, you know, bigger epics that will, uh, you know, take, take you know, the tool kind of a leap forward. Uh, but then we're also prioritizing, uh, you know, just doing a lot of those kind of, you know, uh, improvements that have been suggested and discussed and voted on, you know, on kind. So we, we do that. Um, and and also as we go, you know, we have, we have this thing we call our strategic um, uh, account, you know, program where uh, customers and our strategic accounts, and you know, we have a have a you know deeper conversation, and and there I think it's down to people. I mean, we have the same um, approach there now as as you know we had back in the days when we spoke the first time, Ali, where you know I will you know as soon as you say a feature request, I will always answer by okay, but why? I will do the typical you know the five whys because I really want to understand the problem behind it, and that always leads to a much more interesting question. You know what 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 is the core problem you're trying to solve, and you know how can we uh, and you know we're trying to be not not too quick on 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 showing a solution, but but really noodle around. Okay, you know this problem. Really understanding it, and then okay, well, how, how will we best you know solve that? So, you know, we 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 still have that, and I think we're a little bit more systematic in you know how how we do this now with Fabro. So, um, I think uh, hopefully everyone will feel that that you know every, everyone everyone has a voice. Uh, uh, cool, Johnny, we, we're stealing your time. Sorry, but you know it, it's, it's such an interesting uh, you know um, uh, co innovation uh, with clients. That's a whole seminar in itself. Yeah, true. I mean, this is all great stuff, so don't, no apology necessary. Um, so yeah, and, and I think I, I also want to shout out to, we have uh, some Riot people uh, attending still online. And, and I also want to say, and I'm almost positive because I have other contacts who are still at Riot, that um, Favreau at least played at least some part in your guys' move to remote and has I helped... Imagine. With, with shipping not only Valorant, but also Legends of Runeterra, which remotely, which I think is incredible and I'm a big fan. Um, so that being said, let me uh, go back to our presentation here. And uh, I just wanna call out that I'm gonna be sharing this exact Fabro collection that we're presenting out of uh, with everybody who's registered and everybody who's attended, everybody who's online. And you can click any one of these cards just like you can if you're using Favro, not for presenting. Uh, and there's links, pictures, examples, uh, you name it. So there's tons of good links to articles. Um, again, examples directly in Favro on how to run remote, your game studio remote. Um, take advantage of this. When I share this collection with you, I'm going to make it a public collection, which is another feature of Favro to, to work with um, not only external partners, but also to share information external to your, to your studio. All right. So when Patrick and I first started talking about this, um, one of the very first articles he sent me was from uh, this, this open letter to 
the world basically from Martin Mikos, who is also happens to be a Favreau investor. Um, and he's the CEO of Hacker One. And he says this, you know, the industrial revolution brought us the idea that work is a place different from home and that work is done in physical proximity of many other people. It is the idea of the joint workplace that is the anomaly working from home is natural. And me, myself, this completely resonated with me. I wish somebody had said it sooner. Um, I come from the game industry myself. Uh, I, I, you know, it, it, was, it was very painful to me in a lot of ways when all the game studios in the world, or at least the ones I was working for, made the move to open planned offices. Um, you know, I, and the next quote that I have, I do kind of believe that they became distraction factories in a, in a big way, shape and form. And it all, always kind of felt like, why can't, why do we have to be here? What couldn't we do this remotely? And I think that the world, we're, we're proving that now for good, better or worse, that you can do this remotely. And maybe it is more natural. So this is another one from uh, another quote that's very inspirational. It's uh, kind of inspiring to me that we won't return to the old normal. We'll return to maybe a better normal, right? Where there maybe is a mix of onsite and offsite, but remote work becomes much more prevalent. And, and I do truly believe this too, you know, working in offices myself, especially open plan offices, they are, they have become interruption factories. It's very, your time is literally swish cheesed by, by people coming up to you, asking questions, interruption, all that collaboration is good. And all that co-location is good in some ways, but I feel that the negatives far outweigh kind of the positives of working remotely. Um, the real work truly does get done, right? Uh, when, when you have time to think, when you have uninterrupted time. And although, you know, there might be challenges with people working from home and interruptions at home, a lot of those are passive interruptions that you can control. The interruptions that happen in an office are, are not, you can't control them but you can control your own environment at home, even with, you know, even to a certain extent with kids being at home and homeschooling, which I know is a challenge. It's something else I'm also dealing with. Um, so the benefits, a lot of the benefits are pretty obvious, right? Um, lower overhead. I mean, just, there's just a plethora of cost savings to not having a physical office space, especially if you're a large art organization and all the additional staff, security, uh, maintenance, amenities, you know, the free food, snacks, all that stuff, um, the perks, all those kind of go away, right? You don't have to worry about all that overhead anymore. And we have an article here, you can click on this link, uh, a great article, I, I wrote it, so I think it's great, on how to run your entire game studio out of a single tool, which happens to be Fabro, and that kind of replaces a lot of ways in my mind, the physical office or the physical studio. Um, a, another huge benefit, right, is best talent. And I've spoken with uh, other game studios that I work with directly as an agile coach, and they've already admitted, admitted this to be true from a recruitment standpoint. Um, as Ali called out Riot Games, for example, very co-located in the LA Santa Monica area um, which I love. I'm a big fan of going out there and visiting you guys. Um, but it's, it's a very expensive area, uh, especially in Santa Monica. And not everybody, right, wants to move um, to LA or the LA area in order to, to work for uh, who, uh, any number of studios that happen to be out there. Um, so this opens up the door to hire the best talent regardless of location. And we've talked about this before in previous webinars, but I, I truly believe another big benefit is diversity and the ability to hire people um, outside of your normal comfort zone, your normal comfort range, right? So um, a lot of people say that within the first, first 30 seconds of interviewing somebody, you, you've kind of already made the decision. Is this somebody that I want to work with? Is this somebody I feel comfortable with? Is this somebody who's like me? It's human nature. Now, I'm not saying that that goes away with remote work, but it opens the doors to much more diversity. Culturally, you know, you could hire people from cultures all over the world. We sell, you know, games are being sold all over the world. They're not just being sold to a certain uh, geographic location or demographic or culture. So you want all of those inputs 
all those diverse inputs to make a better product. And I have a quick example of how Fabro can be used for recruitment, uh, especially for remote teams. Here, um, just a kind of a, a simple recruitment Kanban. And as you can see from all of these collections here over on the left, the idea is, is that you don't just run your development out of Fabro, you're really truly able to run your entire studio. And I, and I work with studios that are doing this out of a single tool, out of Fabro. Uh, maybe in conjunction with Slack and maybe in conjunction with Zoom, which we'll talk about in a second. But the real work is getting done here. Even your HR, even your recruiting. And, and that's demonstrated here in this recruitment pipeline. Okay, so happier teams. And this is just all the surveys that are coming out right now talking about, do you want to go back to an office? Do you want to go back to a physical studio? The kind of resounding answer is yes, but, right? Um, a lot of people, the vast majority, it's something like 80% of the, most of the studies I've read, want the flexibility at least to be able to work remotely. Now, they also probably want to have the ability to go back to a studio and have some interaction as needed. Um, but they, they realize that a lot of the real work is getting done remotely from home. And they don't want that to change. It's a huge kind of quality of life increase when you don't have to commute, when you get to spend more time with your family, you can choose your working hours to a certain extent. And happier teams, you know, happier people make happier teams. And it's just been proven time and time again that that leads to increased productivity and increased creativity and even cre increased innovation. Um, another example here I'm not going to jump into, but uh, for you can use this in, when you have the collection um, talking about team KZN backlogs and boards and this whole idea of, of happiness, happiness surveys at the team level. Um, KZN means uh, change for the better and really using a tool like Fabro to, to make that a big focus of your remote teams. It's not just getting the work done. It's also about continuously improving the team and continuously, you know, making sure that the team's happiness level is increasing as well. Um, again, a big part of that, I believe the happiness is no commuting. And uh, the, the average in the U.S. anyway, is that the average commuter spends three to 400 hours per year simply driving and travel in, in a car commuting. And that obviously goes away with remote work. And just that alone is a huge contributor to the happiness factor. Studio culture, the challenges, right? People ask, is studio culture going to, to go away? What, what's the gel that holds us all together? How do we make sure we, we maintain that studio culture? And one of the big uh, insights and truths I, I think that I've had is that the move to remote amplifies both strengths and weaknesses. So if you had kind of a very um, command and control culture, uh, not, not a lot of autonomy uh, prior to moving remote, you're, you're gonna be in trouble, right? Um, that's, that's a weakness that existed prior to the move to remote. And it's one that's just gonna be amplified and exacerbated when you move to remote. Now, there's an opportunity to fix that, and that opportunity is obviously now. Um, it's also going to amplify your strengths. So if you also, if you, if you were like Riot Games, kind of agile by nature, born agile as they say, then that transition is much easier because you had built into your studio culture a lot of autonomy, a lot of trust, a lot of ac accountability. You probably had that autonomy and, and alignment that Patrick referenced earlier. Um, just to call out here, we've written this remote work playbook with lots of tips and tricks to help best practices to help make the move to remote. And just a quick example of how Favro, and they invite me to this sometimes, which is great. Uh, they've started doing these after work gaming events pretty much weekly, um, if not daily. And this is an example of how they use Favro to say, what game should we play that can kind of upvote, downvote? and then setting up a schedule, maybe even leaderboards of, of you know, their after work gaming experiences. And that's really kind of been proven to be um, a great 
boon to the culture, right? It keeps that after work culture alive. So you have, you know, the separation between we're working in Favreau, um, maybe also in Slack, and then Favreau uses Discord, a Discord server for their after work gaming nights. And that says, okay, now we're maybe not at the bar, uh, maybe not hanging out at a restaurant, but we're no longer in a workspace. We're in kind of our fun after workspace. And that's another thing that I really believe continues to maintain that, that fun studio culture that you don't want to have go away. Um, this is one I get all the time as a, an agile coach with this move to remote. Are people working? Um, and, and that's, that's an immediate indicator to me that there was a weakness in the, in the studio culture or the organizational culture to begin with. So if you don't trust that your people are working just because they're not physically there and you can't physically see them, then that's a problem. Now there's an old kind of agile adage, right? Keep your eyes on the baton, not on the runners in a relay race, because it's that baton getting around the track the fastest that's gonna win the race. Don't focus so much on the individual runners or the individual contributors, right? Spending all this time figuring out like we used to, are they over allocated? Are they, are they under allocated? Do we have enough capacity of a specific discipline? Don't worry so much about that. Instead, track the flow of value. Um, again, it, this leads back to what Al, Ali was talking about with outcome driven development. Um, it's not so much how busy our, our people are or how over or under allocated they are. It's and it's not so much about the outputs, how many features or assets we are able to create. You actually want to maximize your outcomes with the minimum amount of outputs. And that all leads back to this kind of tracking the flow of value, watching the, the flow of value, your features, your assets, achieving those outcomes instead of watching your people and how busy they are. Because competing, completing a lot of tasks does not mean that you're actually achieving your goals or you're even leading to, to out, outputs, let alone outcomes. Um, I have a quick example of that uh, in Favreau. And this is just a, a game app team, for example. And some of the metrics built into the boards in Favreau are cycle time, lead time, also known as time on board, time in column. You're able to quickly see at a glance how long each card has been at a particular stage, um, how long it's been on the board in total. And the whole idea is you're trying to reduce those cycle times as you improve as a team. It also calls out, it lets you visualize your work in progress, right? So you can see if something has been stuck at a particular stage, say test or producer review, which is you know, often the case uh, for, for too long, there's a bottleneck there. Why is, why is this card stuck? Why is this particular feature or asset stuck? Oh, um, I also wanna call out, while I'm on this, that built into all of this, of the boards and backlogs, you can switch to different views, a sheets view, a timeline view, and there's also charts built directly into the board. So a perfect example here of kind of tracking that flow instead of um, the people is a burn down chart or a control chart if you're into Kanban, uh, tracks your velocities, gives the velocity with base predictions out into the future. Are you gonna finish a particular iteration, everything you committed to on time or not? Okay, too many meetings. Um, again, another one that I hear a lot after this move to remote. Uh, and I truly believe that too many meetings aren't really the problem, too many pro meetings are the symptom. And they're a symptom of exactly these points. Uh, they don't have, the teams don't have a clear set of goals. Those outcomes, expected outcomes, haven't been clearly communicated. And as Ali also mentioned, they don't know how to track their progress towards those goals. What's the metric towards those goals? Um, so in that case, that's when all of these meetings happen. What is it that I'm supposed to be working on? What is it I'm supposed to be doing? Um, what is what is the goal? What is the goal for this two weeks? What is the goal for the next month? What is the goal for the next three months? So on and so forth. Also being able to visualize your work in progress is super important to be able to kind of see how are we as a team or teams of teams progressing towards what it is we're trying to achieve in a sprint, in an iteration, in a product release. Um, 
the biggest point right here, no way to communicate where the work is flowing. So teams may be using Slack, uh, they might be using Microsoft Teams, whatever the case may be, maybe they're still stuck in email, but the communication has to happen where the work is. And Favreau allows that to happen because you can communicate on the cards directly where the work is happening, where that feature is being developed, where that art asset is being created. I'm gonna show you that in a second. So the big question, right, can people not, non-co-located teams, can remote and distributed teams still collaborate? Can they still innovate? Can they, do they lose the creativity? And, and my answer is, no, they don't. They can absolutely still collaborate, maybe better than they did when they were co-located because they don't, they're, not, they're not interrupted. They can be more productive, more focused. And innovation, creativity can also happen remotely as well. And I have an example of an innovation pipeline here, which you can look at um, after this webinar is over, but it's a focus on tracking the flow of innovation and new ideas the same way you would track the flow of development. And I also have an example here of cross team collaboration. So say you are a, a feature team, feature development team, um, cross-functional team, but you realized in testing you have embedded QA and that embedded QA person, I have a sample comment stream here, again, getting back to communicating where the work is actually happening, where that, those features and assets are being created. Um, this QA analyst realized, okay, I'm trying to take test this feature, take cover behind objects, and I don't have the proper assets block models to test it. So he can communicate with the, the art lead, whoever that may be, um, of another team and have this communication. And then what he can do is he can simply move it to a block column. It automatically flags that card is blocked. Maybe automatically assigns the person who can help remove that impediment. And since you can have the same cards, and this is a huge feature in, in Favro, um, since you can have the same cards and the same boards and backlogs in multiple places, in multiple collections, multiple teams, all he has to do is say, okay, I'm gonna move this or actually add it to the internal art team, this in internal art team's collection. So over in their collection, they're able to see, oh, something's blocked. We're doing feature di driven outcome driven development. Um, we have something that's blocked. We've got to, this is, you know, let's swarm this. We should work on this, get them this block model, whatever the art asset is they need as quickly as possible and eventually remove that block for the uh, internal feature team here. Okay, just a quick run through through some of the solutions that I believe to be really kind of the, the true solutions. And that really breaks down to your culture, your mindset, your values, your principles, um, your processes, your frameworks. I'm a big believer, obviously, in Agile as an Agile coach, and your tooling. So it's the people, the culture, the process, and tools. So first of all, culture. You've got to have that trust. You've got to have a, a culture of trust and accountability, or, or this move to remote is just not going to work. You need to trust your people. Um, you need to trust your teams. And in order to enable that, your leaders can't be command and control. They have to move to this servant leadership mindset. So they're not, they're not there to assign work or delegate work. They're there to set goals, to create the intent. What are the outcomes we're trying to achieve? And then help build those teams, mentor these, those teams and team members, and help clear imp impediments, clear the way. Um, if you're having trouble with continuous integration, continuous release, they can help with that tooling, for example. Now, in a remote world, as the in individual contributor, there's got to be this mindset change from showing up, means I'm working because there's no place to show up to physically, to adding value. So thinking more like a business owner um, instead of an employee. It's all about adding value. What, it, what is it that I'm adding to the studio? What is it I'm adding to my team on a daily basis? Because there is no physically showing up anymore. There's a picture, picture of Patrick um, 
in one of our remote meetings uh, on the on the deck of the USS Enterprise. And I think uh, Patrick, from working with him uh, now and also in the past as a as a boss, um, really kind of exemplifies this servant leadership that I'm talking about. Uh, so remote agile framework. Uh, okay, if you weren't agile before, if you kind of kind of embraced the, this agile way of working, the agile values, the agile pillars, um, principles, now's the time, right? Agile is all about embracing change. Uh, agile is all about dealing with uncertainty, ambiguity, volatility, and we're obviously in those times. If we weren't already before, we definitely are now. So in order to brace change, you have to move to an agile mindset and an agile way of working. And I'm not just talking about team agility. I, I truly believe from visiting game studios all around the world with Handsoft and then Favreau and now independently as an agile coach, that the game industry was great. There were early adopters. We, I was using Scrum back in 2003 at Microsoft Game Studios, but Unfortunately, that agile kind of way of working at most organizations, at most studios, never really made it truly past the team level or, or the teams of teams level, but it definitely didn't make it through the entire organization. And you have to achieve true studio-wide agility. All of your traditional departments from recruiting, HR, finance, marketing, have to also, publishing also have to embrace this, embrace this agile way of working for it to work, especially remote. Studio cadence, it's the heartbeat of the organization to keep that alignment, to keep everyone in sync across teams of teams. You have to have a set synced iteration cadence and a release cadence, a release train, whatever that happens to be. But the entire organization needs to be on that same cadence, at least at the product level, if not the entire organization. Again, studio flow. So tracking that flow of value not just at the team level, but across the entire studio. And Fabro truly allows you, because of its flex flexibility, to do that. And that flow does not happen um, with command and control based teams. You need to have the self-managed teams in order to make that work, again, especially remote. Um, this is a great point that Ali bro brought up. Um, what do you measure? And it's not just me measuring at the team level or teams of teams level, but you should be measuring the flow of value. So how quickly are we able to uh, create an art asset, right? How quickly are we able to deliver a feature? And then measuring, you know, what did our expected outcomes, were those achieved? Did we meet those goals with, the, with the, hopefully the very few outputs necessary to achieve those outcomes? And then, you know, what we're here right now, tooling, right? Favreau is obviously um, a, an excellent agile focus planning and collaboration tool, but it also integrates with say Slack. It integrates with GitHub. Um, it integrates with G Suite. So Favreau can tr kind of truly become your single source of truth for your remote studio. And um, I have just a quick example of that for this this internal art team working with an external art team in Favro. That's another kind of point, right? Internal teams, external teams. Uh, of course, you're, you may be working with an outsourcer, but with the move to remote, the ability to work with externals is even more important than ever because all of your teams are, are basically externals in some way, shape or form. So here is uh, maybe an art director dashboard where he can work, he maybe have a, has a master backlog of all his internal assets and external assets that are being worked on by an external team. He can track these releases, kind of these content bundles at a very, very high level on this board. Whereas the actual art assets, he can be tracking even in the backlog thanks to relations both the internal team, what they're working on, visualizing their art asset work in progress, and the external team, all within the same collection. You know, be committing new assets to an external team as easy as this. Okay, um, I also wanna point out in the time that we have left, uh, 
I did before the pandemic hit. Um, Favreau uh, had me do this very fun project um, where I went out and visited some of the top game producers uh, in the country, in the United States, um, to talk about their experiences with Favreau. And a lot of those talk about remote work even prior to the pandemic. So check them out, click this link when I share this collection with you. All of these interviews that were conducted, these customer success stories are online on this learn.fabro.com. And I also wanna point out before we leave, before we sign off, that again, um, my company Broadcove Insights in partnership with Favro has put together this five day Favro remote game studio quick start package. And the whole intent here is to, for studios that are struggling with the move to remote or they wanna fine tune their move to remote um, with a tool like Favro and, and really make the most of the tool. Uh, we put together this total offering. It includes a 25% Favro annual discount. I work with you directly to, to do all the design configuration, basically optimize your organization in Favro, your studio in Favro, set up all the integrations, again, becoming that single source of truth for your studio, helping with the migration from existing tools to Favro if you choose to do so, or maybe you choose to integrate with them instead. And then this also includes two uh, certification packages. So online training, all live online. We have the certified Fabro platform master for your internal champions, the people who are gonna go out and train the rest of the organization on administration, best practices, uh, basically how to leverage, get the most out of the Fabro planning and collaboration platform. And then also the certified Fabro agile professional for organizations that really do maybe haven't fully embraced this agile way of working, this whole idea of studio flow, and they wanna take their organization, their studios to the next level. And now um, we can open it up to Q and A. Maybe Patrick has already answered some questions, but again, when I do share out this, this collection, um, we'll be putting all those questions and answers here on this board. Uh, cool. Uh, awesome, John. I um, I did answer some questions in the meantime here. Um, the first question we answered live, um, which is um, it was really for Ali, you know, how to convince, right, adopt Favro. Uh, what would you uh, recommend to mid to large size company to consider trying it out? And, and you know, this one we, we answered live. But then we had a second question, which is, um, what are your favorite methods for getting outcome-driven results? And what I did there was that I posted uh, two articles um, where I got interviewed around this. And, you know, John, maybe you can include these articles, these two articles in uh, the mail that we send out to all the attendees. Uh, yeah. That would be great. Uh, and then I also wrote um, um, uh, kind of a short answer, which is that, you know, a good way to approach this is that you, you create an epic in the Favreau backlog, you know, describing what it is that you want to achieve, where you define, you know, the metrics that you want to, uh, to track. So, for example, it could be increase your user engagement, uh, you know, with 5%, um, or maybe there's a certain uh, conversion metrics that you want to increase with, let's say, 6%, you know, those kind of things, um, those kind of metrics. And then you break down that epic into a bunch of user stories, but you really treat these user stories as experiments. So each of these user stories have, have, have a, um, a hypothesis, you know, why you think this experiment will work. And then you try all these experiments and you really need to have the mindset that these are experiments. And hopefully, you know, a few of these experiments, you know, give some pretty good results. And then you double down on those and you basically make kind of a, you know, variants of the experiments, you know, you do some ABC testing and, and you, you know, you, you keep, you know, iterating on that and then you're going to, you know, get to a very good place uh, in terms of improving um, uh, on the metrics on, on an epic level that you try to achieve. Uh, so, so that's the, that's the questions for now, John. Great. Okay. Well, I guess we are done then. 
All right, awesome. It was it was really great to have you all here. And uh, this webinar is now taking a short uh, summer break, and we are back the the sixth of August, right? Yeah. Am it's I right? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I got that right. <laughs> so, you know, um, uh, then we're going to have, I mean, we have an amazing backlog of guests that's going to join this fall. So um, you should definitely tune in every time. Uh, and, uh, and, and if you can't tune in, you know, check out the recordings uh, on our website. So hope to see you then. Ciao. Looking forward to it. Bye everybody. Thank you.